my opinion towards music that's been blowing up recently. I think it's been kind of bad. I'd say it's more negative this year. When you sit down and actually like listen to the music, it's not that good. Every single time I hear like a big hit, I feel like it doesn't hit the same as it did when I was younger. The standard is definitely lower than what it was. There hasn't been many, it's just many like, bangers this year. <laughs> it's a very constant <coughs> loop and it's like the same songs on repeat. Listening to a song that sounds so similar to something else gets frustrating. They're definitely playing it safe in this generation because they know this generation likes a certain type. They know it works so they're just gonna do it again. It'll get replayed thousands of times on TikTok those first little 10 seconds and then you actually click on the, the music and it's actually mid to very subpar. Lil Baby's always gonna have, no matter what song it is, even if it's good or bad, it, it's gonna blow up regardless. I feel like a lot of music today sounds like a JC Penney's commercial. Lyrically, they're just not really up to par with like the past. People go more for the beats than the actual lyrics. I feel like it's not trying to be emotionally evocative. If you see like what's being nominated for the Grammys, like they're just made, like they're industry created. They're just out here because they need something to be released. I see a lot of songs that are just straight copies or samples from older songs. Old songs will resurface because of TikTok and it will kind of ruin the song because all you can think about is that TikTok, which is not really what music's supposed to be about. It's that you're not supposed to think about like social media when you listen to music. A so lot of artists are choosing quick clout over creating a song that will actually stick with you and mean something. Music nowadays is definitely not catered towards feelings, it's catered towards like sparking talk about it or like being catchy, it's not really evoking emotion in their viewers which music used to be about and what music was originally intended for. It doesn't look like it's gonna stop in any way, it's definitely gonna continue to do so. Hopefully, uh, any like the music, the musicians being brought up kind of veer away from that but I do not see that happening.
up. Hey guys, Sean Fay Wolf of Diamond X Studios here, and right off the bat, I just want to apologize for not including Silk Sonic in that big opening mashup. Yeah, I don't know why, but I just had a gut feeling Bruno just really wouldn't fit in that track too well. I don't really know why. I just really hope they don't take it too hard. I mean, we're cool, right guys? I'm in disbelief, this bitch. Yeah, that's about what I expected. Well, I guess Silk Sonic hates me now, which by proxy means it's now illegal for me to have sex. But I do have a feeling that over time, those two will soften on me for not including them in my big commemoration of the popular music of 2022. Because frankly, this was not a year of music that people are going to want to remember. Don't you know I'm good? Yeah, I'm good. 2022 was not a bad year for popular music, at least not as far as quality goes. I've made dozens of videos over the years counting down the worst smash hit songs of various years throughout the past several decades, and my picks for the 10 worst songs of 2022 that we'll be looking at in this video is far from the most scathing list that I've ever put together. In fact, I think I need to rephrase myself. 2022 wasn't a year of pop music that people aren't going to want to remember, but that doesn't change the fact that it was a year of pop music that no one is going to remember, because there's been no point in the past 70 years where big hit songs mattered less than they did in 2022. Now, when you hear that, you're probably thinking I sound crazy. I mean, after all, it's clear from the data that music is more popular now than at any other time in human history. The numbers are all up and the industry is booming. However, if you ask me, the raw numbers are far less interesting and far less telling than the trends that can be found within that data and what they say about the general public's change in focus and philosophy when it comes to the consumption of music. Y you know, let's put this into perspective. What was the biggest musical moment of 2019? Easy, that was Old Town Road, a goofy viral novelty that became one of the biggest memes in internet history and launched the career of one of the most revolutionary pop stars currently working. What was the biggest musical moment of 2020? I'd have to give that to Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion harnessing the nation's lockdown hoardiness to reach their final forms, and then using that newfound power to make Ben Shapiro reclaim his virginity. It's about what <laughs> after all. Biggest musical moment of 2021? Definitely the Olivia Rodrigo phenomenon, a Disney Channel kid breaking out of her cocoon and completely redefining what it means to be a pop star in the new decade. Truly a formative moment for the music listening public of the new generation. And what was the biggest musical moment of 2022? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'd say that's accurate. The biggest musical moment of last year was when everyone realized they really liked a 42-year-old synth-pop classic after they heard it in the fourth season of a six-year-old Netflix show that cost nearly $300 million to make. This was not an isolated incident. Yeah, bitch, that could be a fantasy. Over the years, I've come to realize that the fundamental difference between millennials and Gen Z is that millennials invented the unboxing video while the hippest trend among Zoomers is thrift shopping. This generational shift is actually very refreshing in a lot of ways, and I approve of the mindset overall, but there are certain costs, and they are heavy. I'm well aware of the implications and the gravity of what I'm about to say, so please know that I'm not saying it lightly when I say that I'm pretty sure 2022 marked the beginning of the end of popular music as we've known it since the beginning of the 20th century. Thinking about all I've wasted on you. Over this last year, everyone seemed to come to the collective realization that living in the streaming age means that everyone has full and immediate access to a century's worth of pre-existing pop culture, and that this vast catalog of retro music is full of what are essentially proven assets. I mean, hell, if we're still talking about them all these years later, it must mean that they're quality products which have stood the test of time, right? I mean, there's no marketing around that Chris Brown song that's all over TikTok, no monolithic corporation trying to coerce you into listening to it, so if people are making TikTok dances out of it, that means it has to be a good song by default, right? That's just where we are right now. We're a generation of thrift shoppers, and after moving in that direction for years, 2022 seemed to be the tipping point where the majority of people finally decided that just grifting onto other people's nostalgia is probably a safer bet than being the guinea pig for something new and untested. We're no longer in an age where the only way to get introduced to music is to either listen to whatever current hits the radio is playing, or to pick out one album the record store has in stock to spend your weekend allowing. On. It's just as easy to click on a song released four decades ago as a song released four months ago. 2022 was the first year that old music outsold new music since they first started keeping records in the days of Elvis. In this sense, 2022 marked one of the biggest shifts in the perceptions and priorities surrounding pop music that I've ever seen in my life. And of course, the music industry reacted the only way it knows how, by being capitalist as fuck. I, 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 I'm staying. 
staying alive, we're staying alive. Yeah, for the record, it was not just the consumers doing this. Over the course of 2022, record labels found that it was literally a safer investment to buy out the existing catalogs of retro artists sitting in the vault rather than using that money to promote new artists. And good god can you feel that looking at the pop charts of 2022. Nowadays, if you're not an established artist big enough to pull a guaranteed 20 million streams right out of the gate, as far as the industry is concerned, your song is going to get outstreamed by no role models by J. Cole in its first week, and so they have basically no use for you. Gone are the days of pandemic-era TikTok when the chaos and insanity of a no-radio lockdown laid the ground for hundreds of obscure little indie artists to grab a market share out of nowhere. Now that things are up and running again, the smaller artists are forced to play in the bottom third of the Hot 100, while the top 40 has basically started to run parallel to the American film industry, with the top 1% of blockbuster releases shattering sales records left and right, while the rest of the industry is utterly starved for support. This video is titled The Year Pop Music Died, and the reason for that is, well, because this video was out three months late and I really needed a clickbaity title, but also because, frankly, I don't think I've ever seen the music industry in a less healthy place than it is right now. Pop music has gone through plenty of rocky times and periods of disconnect and irrelevance before, but that was always because of rocky transitions in technology or sudden changes in national taste. By contrast, the problem today seems to be that the post-pandemic world is just a much lonelier, more divided place. A place which, with increasingly rare exception, is no longer conducive to turning pop songs into shared generational experiences. And so we decided to return to the shared generational experiences we already have instead. The looming specter of retro music was like a solar eclipse that hung over new music all year. And you can definitely tell that by looking at the few rays able to shine out from behind it. Musicians did some pretty desperate shit to get noticed in 2022. And so now, I think it's about time I stop pretending to be a real critic and start taking some pot shots at easy targets. As always, I'm only going to be looking at the biggest of the big hits, which for me means anything that made Billboard's year-end Top 100, anything that made Lydia Valentino's more streaming-driven V30 year-end Top 100, and anything that hit the Top 20 on the radio charts. My goal with this video is not to find a bunch of shitty little mistakes no one has ever heard of and point and laugh at them. I really want to emphasize that this is not just terrible music, it's terrible, ridiculously successful music. Regardless of any behind-the-scenes industry fuckery that got them there, the fact is that every song which appears in this video was ten times more popular than anything you were listening to this year. I've been waiting a long time to take these songs down a peg, and so let's not waste any more time. Ladies, gentlemen, and everyone in between, it is my pleasure to present to you... <laughs> Okay, so for the most part, music that I choose for videos like this is pretty egregious. There's songs which I find to be pretty obviously shitty that genuinely piss me off in one way or another. However, we're going to be starting things off a little differently today, because while this first song is far from the most unlistenable thing you're going to hear in this video, I do think that it's a primary example of what made the radio so not fun to listen to in 2022, which absolutely kills me considering who made it. <laughs> You've never been to heaven Anyone who's been following my channel for a while knows what a very difficult choice this was for me to make. Like I said in the intro, Dua Lipa is best girl, and Megan Thee Stallion is the archenemy of worst boy. Uh, seriously, the worst guy you know fucking hates this woman. I really am rooting for both of them to win, but this was the kind of misstep that really does desaturate your enthusiasm for the artists involved. Before I dig into the meat of why that is, let's just get the surface level stuff out of the way, because structurally, this song is a complete mess. The hook is just a less catchy version of There's Nothing Holding Me Back by Shawn Mendes. Dua's supposed to sound smooth and seductive, but she just sounds bored out of her mind. Half of Megan's verse has to be censored out of what was very clearly designed to be a crossover radio hit. And, and I'm sorry, can someone please explain to me how we've gotten to a point where a duet between a hip-hop queen and a disco princess is completely indistinguishable from a number one country hit? Yeah. 
I mean, I know that genres basically don't exist anymore these days, but that is pretty fucking egregious. Oh, and speaking of egregious, screw this song's title. I got the flavor the last, yeah, the sweetest pie. Free Sweetest Pie is gross and sleazy, and the fact that it's the main hook of this thing is fucking moronic. I mean, granted, between Dua's half-hearted cooing and Megan's firebrand dominatrix shtick, I couldn't tell you this song's tone if you put a gun to my head, but I could tell you that that title does not match whatever the hell that tone is, because pie is a low low-tier sex word. It comes out of her mouth and I feel like I'm listening to a Family Guy sketch. This morning, she made me eat the hair in her pie. <laughs> no, it's not what you think. Stewie had some too. <laughs> Stop punching me! You know how Robin Thicke and Jason Derulo and all those guys can say shit like you the hottest bitch in this place and your booty's like two planets and honey got some boobies like wow 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 and they still get laid because they're celebrities and girls are gonna flock to them regardless? I'm pretty sure that saying come take a bite of my sweetest pie is the female equivalent of that. Like Dua Lipa is just so accustomed to men simping over her that she can say she has the sweetest pie and all the guys are like oh hell yeah you do. Please let me have a slice of your pie. Which by the way, fucking pathetic you guys. Come on, show a little bit of tact. Wait, what the hell is going on? Wait, what are you talking about? No, the kettle's the one who's black. It, shut up! You got me hung up from across the room. Look, I'll always have a soft spot for Dua Lipa in my heart and a significantly less soft spot for Dua Lipa in my pants. Wait, no, cut that line. That's way grosser than any of the pie shit. Look, I'll always have a soft spot for Dua Lipa in my heart, but honestly, at this point, I'm kind of done with her music. Now that future nostalgia is going on three years old and all of its singles have been overplayed into the ground, hindsight is telling me that the reason that album was so good was that Dua threw every good idea she had into one place and had a great team to support them. As she continues to travel on her disco train to increasingly diminishing returns, I'm finding that Dua Lipa's default settings as a pop star are nothing more or less than extremely competent. And I can't tell you how sick I am of pop music being so aggressively, intensely, miserably competent. If you've been watching my videos, you'll know that I think the average quality of pop music has been trending upwards over the past half a decade or so, but the more time goes on, the more I'm starting to suspect that that isn't because people are actually getting better at making music, but rather because the music industry's algorithms designed to keep people listening are becoming more and more optimized. I mean, pop music has always been artificial to a certain degree. All throughout the 20th century, you had plenty of pop music designed by commission through extensive focus group testing, but at least focus group testing still involves talking to other actual humans. Listening to Top 40 radio these days feels like living in the Matrix, a simulation of enjoyable music custom designed to be just barely fulfilling enough that most people don't feel like it's worth the energy to question it. For the record, Sweetest Pie just barely beat out that Doja Cat and Post Malone collab for the number 10 spot. I hate that one for very similar reasons, but at least in the context of its album, it could be read as Posty trying to lie himself out of depression by forcing a smile, whereas I don't think there's any good faith reading that will make sweetest pie seem any less cynical. I mean, come on. Do you really think the woman who made big ol' freak, thought shit, and wet ass pussy looked down into her heart of hearts and said, you know what? There aren't enough Dua Lipa disco songs on the radio, and it's up to me, Megan the Stallion, to fix that problem. No, she did this because she wanted to break out of her hip-hop niche and make a big splash on the pop charts. It's a shame because Traumazine was a good album that shows that Megan clearly knows her appeal and is willing to go for it hard. This whole situation kind of reminds me of how the lead single off of Michael Jackson's Thriller was The Girl Is Mine, a dorky, shitty duet with an off-brand collaborator meant to pander to the most middling trends of the time and hook in all the normies before the actual album dropped and knocked everyone's socks off. The difference, of course, being that this strategy helped MJ get the best-selling album of all time, while it led Megan's album to underperform her previous one by a 10 to 1 margin. We've got nine more songs to cover on this list, and all the rest of those are far more obviously shitty than Sweetest Pie, but if I'm honest with myself, I wouldn't feel right if I didn't have at least one song in this top 10 that represented that unscratchable itch of artificiality, lack of fulfillment, and rank corporatism that seems to be running through the core of so much otherwise decent pop music these days. And Sweetest Pie was the primary example of this to hit it big in 2022. And if that reason isn't good enough justification for this song making the list, well, it also has this line in it. I wanna put his nutty buddy in my fudge round. Oh, the...
shit, we're rolling. Um, uh, okay, so, um, you know, I've been paying attention to the uh, pop music of 2022 all year, and I've been looking for any trends and patterns I can notice, and there actually was one very pronounced pattern which only got more and more eerie as the year went on, and that's how eerily similar the pop music of 2022 was to the pop music of 2014. I mean, think about it. The biggest hit at the start of the year was a viral Disney song that absolutely dominated the internet. Aside from that, there were basically no big smashes, with the same handful of hits constipating the top 10 for months on end. In fact, there were so few big hits worth getting excited over that the most talked about musical event of the summer was based around music from literally 40 years earlier. There was more Spanish music on the charts than usual, the year's biggest hit was the soundtrack to something awful and overexposed that children are obsessed with, Megan Trainer popped up out of nowhere right at the end. Oh, and one other small thing. Guess who was all over the radio this year? Yep, One Republic are back, and they brought whistles with them. I ain't guess what? Because y'all have been so good this year, I've decided that for this spot and this spot only, I'm gonna give y'all a poof for one deal. Yeah. Why you calling at 11.30 when you only wanna do me dirty? At a glance, it might seem kind of random to pair these two up, but it's not without purpose. Charlie Puth and One Republic frontman Ryan Tedder are in basically the same position, being longtime music industry professionals who don't really have a particularly large or distinctive fan base of their own, but who get a disproportionate amount of industry support as a reward for writing hits for more interesting people. You probably haven't thought about either of their names for a while, but Puth and Tedder have both been extremely lucrative behind-the-scenes assets over the past few years, the most notable examples being Stay by the Kid Leroy and Justin Bieber, which was written and produced by Puth, and That's What I Want by Lil Nas X, which was written and produced by Tedder. Because of this, the powers that be rewarded these two very good boys by giving Puth a huge radio push all throughout 2022, and letting Tedder write and perform the theme song for Top Gun Maverick. These were incredible success stories for the two men, and they also happen to be some of the most perfect and obnoxious examples of music industry veterans trying to cling on to relevance as the world evolves further and further past the need for them. Of the two, Light Switch is the lesser evil, so let's get that one out of the way first. I just want attention. Charlie Puth trademark as an artist ever since his self-directed 2018 album Voice Notes has been this kind of Richard Carpenter meets the Fonz vibe. He's an absurdly gifted arranger and composer that has this kind of corny yet understated brash arrogant coolness, which is clearly all an act, but it's an act he's having fun with. All the hits from that album were mid to high tempo, but they burned slowly, really letting you stew in the uncomfortable yet expertly crafted atmosphere. Unfortunately, we now live in an era where one of the primary forms of entertainment is basically just Teletubbies for adults, and so slow burns didn't seem to be something who thought would sell anymore, leading to a song with momentary flashes of beautiful harmonies and type production that are completely lost in a looping, hyperactive ADHD melody that has no resolution to speak of, instead being built around this. You turn me on like a light switch when you're moving your body around and around. Come on, come on, come on kids, dance to the song. Dance to the song. I, I know you want to. I know you want to dance to the song. Come on, come on. I know what you do. I've seen those TikToks where there's a beat switch up and you smash cut to you and it's a different outfit or some dumb shit. I've done my research. I know what you kids like. So come on, let's make like Marvin Gaye and get it on. Chop, chop. You turn me on like a light switch. When you're moving your body. I don't know if Charlie Puth was specifically trying for another big hit by playing to TikTok or if this no chill hyperactive crap was actually what he wanted to make. But believe it or not, I'm actually a bit more inclined to believe the latter since Charlie Puth has apparently been so unbelievable horny since the lockdown started that he's been sharing every possible detail of his sex life with an increasingly baffled public. Charlie Puth literally went up to Adam Levine and told him this love was the first song he ever jerked off to, to which Adam responded, and I quote, that's really weird. Now, does this have anything to do with Light Switch? No. But did I just find out about it and have to tell someone? Yes. Yes, I did. Because the fact that Adam Levine learned that he made the first song Charlie Puth buttered his corn to, and that wasn't the biggest L his sex life took in 2022, is goddamn hysterical. I don't know what you've been told. Now, I wish I had anything nearly as incredible to share about I Ain't Worried, but frankly, I think the only real point I have to make about this song is that Portugal the Man ruined white guys forever. Ooh, I'm a rebel just for kicks I mean, no hate to them. They're a cool band and feel it still was a good track, but the impact that that goddamn song has had on the world of pop music has been catastrophic. After Feel It Still dropped for the first time in like a decade, white guys had a generic sound target to aim at, and the accursed spawn of that song have come to define the sound of the most turgid white noise threat of pop radio. I've been feeling it since 1966, keeping dreams alive, 1999, 
Heroes. I ain't worried is the Walmart version of Hold On, which was the Costco version of Sucker, which was the dollar store version of Feel It Still, which was already the Target version of Young Folks, which was already the gentrified version of Please Mr. Postman, but we're losing the thread here. Look, taking blatant inspiration is not new for Ryan Tedder. He's gotten in trouble for that before, but my issue with I Ain't Worried isn't that it sounds like something else, it's that it sounds like nothing. I thought this was an Imagine Dragons song the first time I heard it on the radio. It's got the empty echoes and upward inflections from Thunder and the awful vocal laceration of Believer, and it's so fucking stilted. The chorus just kicks in with no buildup whatsoever. It's like... You know when you're using a high-quality crayon, it flows really well, just smoothly gliding across the paper, but then you get a shitty crayon and the wax just scrapes along and just doesn't flow smoothly and it just looks all gross and lumpy, and then you look at what you've drawn and you realize that its vocal processing sounds like wet sandpaper? But I I genuinely don't get why anyone would choose to listen to this. I don't know if there's a better example of how we've lost the soul of the 80s in our attempt to corporatize it to death. You do realize what song they made in the 80s to soundtrack their big, dumb, badass airplane movie, right? That's right, goddamn Danger Zone, one of the purest hype soundtracks of all time. Uh, for the record, I didn't put these on. This is just naturally what happens whenever this song starts playing. Uh, I'll watch. Uh, pause the music. Yeah, see? honestly pretty sad. One of the most entertaining things about the original Top Gun was that it had this very distinct blend of over-the-top 80s hetero-masculinity tied in with a very palpable homoerotic undertone. It's just a very sweaty, lustful human movie from pretty much every angle you can think of. And then you've got Top Gun Maverick, which is better than the original in every technical sense, and yet every single trace of any of that lustful subtext has been bleached out of existence. Humans often disagree with each other, and so Hollywood's go-to solution these days to make their films have a wider appeal is to make them feel less human. And I Ain't Worried is the musical equivalent of that. It's a pale imitation of cavalier, devil-may-care badassery with this distinct antiseptic aftertaste because it was scrubbed of anything distinct for the aim of alienating nobody. Danger Zone makes you feel like a kid having an amazing badass adventure playing with your toy fighter jets. I Ain't Worried makes you feel like a trust fund kid lounging back on a yacht with a pile of crushed LaCroix cans next to you. So, in conclusion, it sounds like a song that Charlie Puth would masturbate to. Come on, come on, come on, come on. In the past few years, there seems to be this unspoken fear that pop music might be about to regress back to the sound of the Trump era, where all the big hits were really moody and depressed, and any happy music sounded like it was being produced with a gun to the artist's head. I don't think things are going to get that bad again anytime soon, since artists today have learned that music doesn't have to be just hyperactive and smiley, or just dour and miserable. There's beauty to be found in relaxed contentment. Unfortunately, the label heads don't seem to have realized that yet, which is how we end up with crap like this. Songs that really want to be inspiring and fun, but in reality are about as uplifting and inspiring as a kid being forced to smile for a family Christmas card. I ain't worried about it. We'll be revolting children till our revolting's done. And we'll have the chance for bolting, we're revolting. No. No, we're not doing this. I no, I'm not gonna let this happen. No, no, I, I refuse this on principle. You have had your fun, Elton. Cold Heart was a cute little song, and even though it was basically the radio's concubine all year, and I never want to hear it again in my life, I let it slide because it was a one time thing. Oh, look at that. Elton John's got a top 10 hit in 2022. Isn't that wacky? Well, guess what? It ain't wacky anymore. It's just weird and desperate and sad and nothing more than yet another reminder that pop culture is in such a dead zone that we can't do anything but wrap ourselves in the past like a security blanket crusted with cat piss. Look, I don't care about Rocket Man. I don't care about Sacrifice. Paint those up with a chintzy coat of Dua Lipa glitter all you want to, but Tiny Dancer is the best thing you and Bernie ever did together. A genuine masterclass in pop music and one of the most perfect songs of the 1970s and you're stripping it down for parts for the sake of this? Oh, 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 this 
is some of the worst vocal processing I've ever heard in my life. I have no clue what the hell happened here. Elton John has one of the most naturally appealing voices in pop music history. I distinctly remember hearing that song he did with the Sunday Best Guys back in 2020 and thinking, damn, this guy still got it. However, I'm starting to think that at age 75, Elton John might finally be hitting the wall. Because he sampled his old vocals from the 80s for Cold Heart, he sounded pretty shaky on that Christmas song he made with Ed Sheeran, and now... There are caravans we follow How you doing, fellow kids? What are you doing? Singing today? Well, let me join you. With sex and love no longer dead feel unclean listening to this. It kind of reminds me of that time Harper Lee got tricked into publishing an old unfinished draft of To Kill a Mockingbird and then they marketed it as the lost prequel because the publishers wanted to wring an extra payday out of her before she passed away. Except instead of taking advantage of a senile 89-year-old woman, Elton John is still very much aware, fully complicit in pumping out these remixes and then turning around to say that pop songs these days aren't real music. It's like hearing Tucker Carlson whining about the news being fake and then you're just like, oh well thank god you're here to solve the problem. Even putting the vote Vocals aside, though, the production and arrangement here are just bad. None of these lines scan properly, the whole thing is just so overmixed, and outside of a decent bass line, I can't point to a single element of this production that isn't gross, soupy disco sludge at worst, or just Cold Heart 2 electric shoe rogaloo at best. Cold Heart worked because it took the strongest parts of both Sacrifice and Rocket Man and wove them together into a cohesive, flowing melody while sprinkling random little bits of Elton's discography through the background as cute little easter eggs. Hold Me Closer sounds exactly like what it is. Two disparate parts mashed together carelessly, and even going so far as to take the amazing hook of Tiny Dancer and turning it into this. <laughs> God, that's irritating. I, I genuinely don't get how this happened. Hold Me Closer was produced by the same guy who made Break My Heart by Dua Lipa and Midnight Sky by Miley Cyrus. Two absolutely incredible disco synth tracks which also teeter right on the edge of inspiration and theft. This guy clearly knows how to work this particular sound masterfully, so why the hell does this song sound like the David Guetta remix of itself? <laughs> Under ordinary circumstances, I may have cut this song a break and left it off the list, because yeah, there are eligible songs not in this top 10 that I do dislike listening to more than this one. However, not only do I have virtually no respect for this song as a piece of art, but I felt the need to put this on here because it was the pinnacle of an absolute tidal wave of lazy, shitty sampling that completely dominated the pop scene of 2022. Remember how I said in the beginning that old music is outselling new music for the first time ever and that's absolutely scared the shit out of the music industry? Yeah, well, the industry response to that seems to be if you can't beat them, inhale them and steal their copyability. Because a plurality of big hit songs this year had an extremely obvious, well-known sample as their main and often only selling point. Do you want me to give you an idea of just how bad it got? Never take a L no more. I don't wanna know. I just can't get you out of my bed. You love you. I love me. I, 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 I'm staying alive. I'm good, yeah, I'm feeling alright. There's so much things I ain't done yet. Watch on my wrist, but I want that diamond. Only miss the sun when it starts to snow. Baby, <laughs> bitch, I could be a fantasy. One more time. You still make my heart. Yes, all of those songs charted in 2022, and yes, even country music is doing this shit now. I guess no jangling key is more enticing than the one you already know. I was originally going to end this segment here, but I do quickly want to address the elephant in the room, which is that this is Britney Spears' first song to hit the top 10 since she escaped her father's legal control. If you look at all the comments under the video, pretty much all of them are saying that the music doesn't really matter, it's all about what's best for her. It's also worth noting that the reason Britney was chosen to be the feature for this song was because Elton's husband suggested it might be a healthy means of coping with her trauma and getting her back into music. That is incredibly sweet and heartwarming. I'm genuinely happy that she's doing better now, and it just makes me wish even more that she could have had her triumphant return with something good. I was also happy to see Kesha back in the top 5 in 2021, but that didn't make the fancy-like remix any less insufferable. I guess it's true what the funny rat movie said. In the grand scheme of things, the average piece of junk is probably more meaningful than our criticism designating it so. However, this is my 
video and my criticism, and I do, in fact, think this song is a piece of junk. Frankly, the only thing that excites me about this song is imagining what ridiculous Frankenstein mashups are going to come out of Elton John's back catalog next. Uh, Sir Elton, if you're listening, I do actually have some ideas for you uh, if you're interested in listening. <coughs> Benny and the Yellow Brick Road featuring Olivia Rodrigo. Someone Saved My Crocodile Tonight featuring Cardi B. Philadelphia Jerk Off featuring Lil Luzi Vert. I guess that's why they call it Daniel featuring the damn Daniel guy. Don't Go Breaking My Heart When You Go Down On Me featuring Lil Nas X. And of course, a belated tribute to the late queen of your beloved homeland, Candle in the Wind 23 featuring Megan Thee Stallion. Come on, Elton. You know you want to. And on the subject of Megan Thee Stallion, I actually have a quick question for you. Are any of y'all interested in becoming canon to the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Well, now you can, because one of the superheroes in the MCU is She-Hulk, and She-Hulk famously twerked with Megan Thee Stallion, and Megan Thee Stallion was, of course, on Sweetest Pie with Dua Lipa, and Dua Lipa made Electricity with Silk City, which was a collaboration between Diplo and Mark Ronson, and Mark Ronson made Feel It Right with Mystical, and Mystical was featured on Woof by Snoop Dogg, and you know what's cool about Snoop Dogg? I'm giving a shout out to my dog, the one and only, Sean, you understand me, Shiny Sean. Sean Fay Wolf. That's right, Snoop Dogg knows that I exist, for reasons more stupid and complicated than can be recounted at the present time. And that means that if you join my Patreon and get added to the end credits of my videos, by the law of Kevin Bacon, you will officially become canon to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I don't think I could possibly offer you anything more incredible than that, but just to sweeten the deal a little bit, joining my Patreon does also have a few other perks, such as voting for what I talk about next, access to a community of awesome people on my Discord server, early access to my videos before they premiere, and direct content contributions to my videos through my grab bag review series, my fan rankings, and several other community-driven projects I have in the works. It's probably not lost on you guys that this is the first real video I've uploaded in quite some time, and that's because in 2022, my grandmother became very sick, and I basically had to drop everything to become her primary caregiver for several months. It was an extraordinarily stressful and taxing time for me, but thanks to the support of my patrons, I knew that I didn't have to worry about my hiatus causing YouTube's algorithm to bury my channel and destroy my income because my Patreon meant my income would still be stable regardless of when I returned. The financial security you guys gave me meant that I was able to devote the entirety of my energy to being there for my family when they needed me the most. Words don't exist to fully convey the gravity of my feelings about that. You guys basically saved my life this year. I am extremely grateful for everything you guys have given me, but unfortunately I'm not yet as financially stable as I'd like to be. So if you are enjoying my work, the best way to show your support is on Patreon, starting at just $1 per video. And also, again, you'll be canon to the MCU, which means that the next time your annoying cousin starts showing off his venomized Thanos Funko Pop, you'll have an automatic win button against him. What can I say? Some things in life are priceless including the look on my face when I first heard the next song on this list. We are revolting children living in revolting times. We sing revolting songs. We sing revolting rhymes. I was into you, but I'm over it now. And I was trying to be nice, but nothing's getting ABCDEFU by Gale is not on this list. A, B, C, D, e, F, U, and your mom. I know. I know. Trust me. I know. Believe me, this was not a quick decision to come to. This is an awful piece of music, irritating, badly made, and the perfect representation of every good thing TikTok once did for music, which has now been lost. It was a shoe in for my worst list for the majority of the year, but honestly, once the shock of this song's dubious backstory had worn off on me, I came to realize that I don't actually hate the experience of listening to ABCDEFU. I just kind of dislike it. True, it is basically a proven fact that this song was carefully designed by committee to look like an annoying, gimmicky, ear-grating little teenage embarrassment that fluked its way into viral success, but let's be honest, no matter how hard they try, the labels will never be able to fully replicate the magic of the real thing. This is Romantic Homicide by David. He spells his name with a four because of course he does. It was a TikTok sleeper hit. 
I've seen a lot of my friends say that they like this one quite a bit. Honestly, I do kind of get it, at least in theory. A few years back, when I was talking about why I liked Robbery by Juice World when everyone else seemed to hate it, I came up with a term that I called the Wounded Dog Single. Basically, that's my name for a song that's extremely abrasive in presentation, tone, and or content, but still works because it taps into deep, primal pain and can be cathartic when you're in such pain that you just want something to scream along with as you rip yourself open and bleed. If you're someone who feels that way about romantic homicide, then I'm glad it was able to give you relief. And I give you permission to not watch the remainder of this section, because I'm sorry, this is one of the funniest things I've ever heard in my life. Feels like you don't care. When I hear this, I hear a half-formed mess, and literally all I can think of are names to call it. Twinkcore, The Kid Leroy Curdled in the Sun, The Most Incorrect Possible Joji, 96 Tears Being Played on an Abandoned Radio in a Mud Puddle, What the I Hate You, I Love You guy listens to after he can't get it up for a Tinder date. But I think the most accurate word to describe this is gamer tag core. You know, those kids in their mom's basement who give themselves these cool, edgy names and think they're these cool, badass edgelords. But really, their thoughts are mostly just shit like this. In the back of my mind. Real deep, bruh. Feel your feelings, bruh. And I'm sick of waiting patiently for someone that won't even cry. This song sounds like a kid crying into his phone because the cute girl he's working on a social studies project with left him on red for eight minutes. It's one of the most quintessential examples I've ever seen of a teenager who's never seen the rough side of a kitchen sponge, let alone life, experiencing sadness for the first time, having literally zero interesting ideas for how to convey that sadness, but thinking that because the emotion is so big inside him, just writing down the most basic attributes of the experience will be enough to make the song engaging. And you know what the saddest part is? He's not even doing it well. For comparison's sake, let's go look at the king of gamer tag core. Look, say what you will about XXX Tentacion, and trust me, I have. But when he felt something, he made damn sure that you were gonna feel it too. He had no qualms about letting his ugly bitterness out, and he let his audience steep in his pain, as douchey and self-serving as that pain often was. That's what was so unsettling, but also so compelling about him. When X said, I'll end myself if you break up with me, or when he wrote a song about a fan who took her own life against her family's wishes, you truly felt like you were taking a trip into the darkest, most unpleasant, and yet most captivating elements of a teenager's mind. I mean, I'm not trying to say that DeForvid should go around gaslighting his girlfriend, but for God's sake, even when X made a song that was just him saying, you're changing, I can't stand it over and over again, you felt like he was genuinely sad and not trying to win over a crowd of goth middle schoolers at a poetry slam. In the back of my mind, I killed you. When I hear that line, the only thing I can think of is the only girl in the COD lobby just headshotted me three times in a row, all my friends are making fun of me, fuck my life. That's just the vibe I get from this entire song, and so I can't say that I was particularly surprised to find out where this song came from. In the back of my mind, you died. Yeah. This guy, DeForvid, he's a Fortnite YouTuber with 60,000 subscribers. He had only been making music for a few months before he made Romantic Homicide, and he only started because he needed background music for his kill montages that wouldn't get flagged by copyright bots. No. You are not hearing me incorrectly. The most streamed breakup song of 2022 was the soundtrack to a Fortnite AMV made entirely out of obligation by a 17-year-old. Maybe lying if I said it didn't fit. I truly cannot think of a more fitting context for this song than under this. <laughs> By the way, that freakout video is fake, so yeah, don't worry, I'm not making fun of any actual kids on here. You know, except that one. I hate you. Despite everything I've said here, you know how the saying goes, there's a 14-year-old born every minute 14 years ago, which means that this song has proven very stable on the streaming charts and is sure to carry deep into 2023. As with any young artist, I don't want this to come across as an attack on the kid specifically, only on this one song. I haven't listened to his back catalog, I'm sure he's got better stuff than this. And hell, I'm sure he's made more money off this one song than I've made in my entire half a decade on this channel. Do you know what? Good for him. Hopefully he'll use that spotlight to go on to bigger and better things. I almost feel bad making fun of this so much, since this guy is clearly gonna die of embarrassment anytime he thinks about this song in a few years anyways, but eh, I'm sure he'll get over it. After all, in the back of his mind, I'm already dead.
Okay, so this song came out pretty late in the year, and I was originally going to put it in the same camp as that new Megan Trainer song as a problem for future Sean to deal with, but over the course of writing this list, it just kept on creeping back into my head over and over again, and eventually I cracked and put it on the list because... Oh my god, I'm so sick of this shit. 21, can you do something for me? 21. Can you hit a little rich flex for me in 21? Remember that time between 2018 and 2019 when Drake was in the top 10 for literally an entire year and a half straight? You know, I put up anti-Drake posters to ward away his possession and both I and literally everyone else whined non-stop about how he wouldn't go away. God, I mean, that almost seems cute in hindsight. I mean, who complains about Drake? Why would you do that? Drake is just a fact of life. What's the point in taking umbrage with his presence? Now that TikTok has brought upbeat pop music back and Drake is no longer to the charts what carbon is to the Earth's atmosphere, I think most people were content to just accept Drake's omnipresence as a simple fact of chart watching. Then he dropped three albums in one year. This is no longer okay. And I'm way too sexy to go unprotected. I think we can now safely say that Drake is entering his prism era. His career is basically just running on momentum at this point, and someday that momentum is gonna run out. Granted, he's still got a lot of momentum. To put it in perspective, his album from June was considered a commercial disappointment because the wrong song from it went to number one. But still, I can't see these rapid-fire album drops as anything but Drake having an anxiety attack as he feels his foundations wobbling. Everything that he did this year with some of the most desperate, panicked groveling to his audience that I've ever seen an artist of his size do. Oh, you didn't like my album, did you? Oh, uh, well look, I made a whole new album and it's totally different from anything I've ever done before. Uh, oh, oh, you, you didn't like that one either. Oh, oh, but, but wait, you did like the one song with 21 Savage? Oh, okay, well here's a whole album with 21 Savage. You like this one, right? 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 Honestly, I feel like I'm watching Elon Musk trying to tempt Trump back onto Twitter. Drake's spot at number one is his daddy, and he will do anything to be a good boy for his daddy. I saw more average music listeners turning away from Drake this year than at any other point in the past decade. I mean, hell, even the Amish are shitting on him now, which is completely understandable considering that Drake's three primary traits as an artist these days seem to be exhaustion, desperation, and divorced. Drake still has an army of fans, but unlike fellow artist of the 2010s Taylor Swift, something tells me he's not going to be making many new fans anymore. And Rich Flex is one of the clearest examples I've ever seen of a man who knows he has millions of followers who will buy anything he puts out, which means that he doesn't have to try anymore. Need to remember who y'all talking to. It's a slaughter gang CEO. Regarding the song itself, there's very little to discuss. Unlike Certified Lover Boy or Honestly Nevermind, her loss has no real standout tracks. The only thing that stands out about the album is how unusually misogynistic it is, even by Drake standards. Rich Flex blends into the gray fog of the rest of the project, with the only remotely funny thing about it being that he finally just dropped the pretext and made a song with a hook that literally says, 21 Savage exists and he is my friend. 21. Do your thing, 21, do your thing. Drake does his normal shtick for about half of it, then he tries to mimic 21's flow for the other half, and none of it is entertaining or enjoyable. I mean, hell, even the top comments under the song are all making fun of him. And while we're on the topic of switch-ups, one thing that the past five years has taught me pretty definitively is that there is exactly one person in the world who understands why Sicko Mode worked as well as it did, and that person is me. You can't just play two half songs back-to-back -back and then expect that to work. No, you actually need to put in transitions, have some sort of coherent through-line that strings the entire thing Thing together. It should look like one cohesive project when you look at it from a bird's eye view. So yeah, please stop making bad sicko modes. Y'all are just embarrassing yourselves. Oh my god, sir, did you hear what that white kid with the face said? Of course I heard what the white kid with the face said. Send the word out. Shut down Operation Pandemic of Sickos immediately. But sir, what about Gunna? That operation is the only chance he has to live. Never tell me the odds. Yellow diamonds in the wash. This shit costs a lot. Rich Flex is not a particular standout from this album. It's mostly here just because it was the only one big enough to qualify for this list. But one very alarming thing about this song in particular is just how willing 21 Savage is to sink down to Drake's level. I can only assume that 21 threw together all his bits haphazardly a month before it dropped because Drake got down on his knees and begged because 21 Savage is a good rapper and I refuse to believe that his contribution to this song is anything more than a half-hearted first draft. Unlike Jimmy Cook's or Knife Talk where 21 brought out the best in Drake, Rich Flex has Drake as the one bringing out the worst in 21. From gross, self-serving dude bro sliminess. I know you on your pair, baby. Can you suck it? To half-formed dad jokes. Took her panties off and this bitch thicker than a plaque. To, of course, this. I'm a savage. 21. Smacker, booty, and magic. I slap a pussy nigga with the ratchet. Dude, 
That is a bold fucking choice to interpolate Megan the Stallion on an album that also has Circo Loco on it. This bitch lie by getting shots, but she's still a stallion. She don't even get the joke, but she's still smiling. Yeah, in case you missed it, Drake made a joke implying that Megan the Stallion lied about getting shot by Tory Lanez, which is an unforgivable thing to do at any time, but to do it right now is just mind-numbingly idiotic. It's right up there with whoever at Warner Brothers said, oh, you know what we need right now? A Harry Potter reboot. No, no we don't. That is a terrible idea, and you could not even theoretically craft a worse time to have it. Sticks and stones, chrome on chrome, that's just what a nigga on. I compared Drake to Elon Musk as a joke before, but you know what? I don't think I was kidding. I think that's a perfect summary of where Drake is right now. He's the Elon Musk of hip-hop. He got to the top of the game through dubious methods, he's fumbled every woman in his life in the most public and embarrassing way imaginable, he's got no real charisma, and he has to resort to being a walking meme just to get attention. All he ever truly had is capital, and now even that is finally collapsing. 21, you can do something for me, and that something is to jump ship because the S has Drake has hit an iceberg, and you do not want to be on board for what happens next. Alright, and with that, I think it's about time to take a break from the main list and take a look at some dishonorable mentions. But there is something else I'd quickly like to do before that, because naturally I've been pretty negative throughout this entire video, and I really feel like I should do something to counteract that and add a little bit of joy to the world. And I'm going to do that by making a deal with you. I am going to play a video of baby ferrets flopping around, and in return, you have to give this video a like, subscribe to my channel, and hit the bell for notifications of new uploads. That's the deal, and the faster you do it, the more time you get to spend watching these little guys. Ready, set, go. And there we go. Thank you all so much for your support. And now let's wrap up the first half of this video by taking a look at some dishonorable mentions. I see in love and she been over once. It's not like I know no for months. This was originally gonna be on the list until Rich Flex swooped in right at the end of the year and stole its spot. And this is where I was originally going to rant about the pandemic of lazy sampling. Seriously, we gotta put up some caution tape here because this was a murder. I, 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 I'm staying alive, I'm staying alive, I'm staying alive. Don't never be. Yeah, sorry, no. I give you my hours and advice just trying to fix you and all your daddy issues. So one of my all-time favorite out-of-context lines comes from Shakespeare's Macbeth. There's a scene in that play where Lady Macduff is being interrogated by a criminal. One of her young sons starts harassing the guy, and then he spouts out the immortal line, What, you egg? And then kills the kid. But to be clear, the word egg meant exactly the same thing in the 1500s as it does now, but it's clear what Shakespeare meant. He was trying to convey what an annoying, shit-nosed little pain in the ass that guy found the kid to be. And so, moving forward, anytime I hear a song where the singer is acting like the obnoxious child they are, I shall call them an egg, and kindly request that they close their word hole. For example... When you said you loved me, well, you must have had your fingers crossed. Silence, egg! And you know what, just for good measure... I kill you. Silence, egg! Baby. I really didn't feel this one at first, but the desperate slurry vibe it was going for did grow on me over time. I actually do get what they were going for. It's not nearly good enough to justify the phrase Chris Brown's new grassroots sleeper hit, though. I'm unstoppable today. Chandelier, but worse. And again, this came from a seven-year-old album from a person we now know to be a weird possessive creep. Why the hell are we playing it every ten seconds on the radio now? The song sounds like it was written by a nun trying to be hip with the kids. I'm I'm like a Porsche. Oh yes, a Porsche. You know, one of those new fancy hot rods all the kids are riding. Oh, but what next? Oh, I'm I'm like a Porsche with with no brakes. Oh yes, that's excellent. No brakes because this woman is unable to slow down or stop herself on account of all of the sex she's having. Me, I'd rather hit him up one more time. I would have shot this straight to number one on this list if it hadn't fallen off so quickly. You came by happiness. Better. Not gonna lie, there is some deep, profound truth to the idea that it would bring a lot of happiness and fulfillment to young people if they could afford enough dirt to build a white picket fence around. And I can put you in. 
Hey, remember that first thing Jack Harlow did that made everyone say, oh, he's a cool guy, I'm glad he's around. And then he did a second thing and everyone was like, oh, that's unfortunate. I've seen people say that Jack Harlow was always like this, but nah, what's poppin' holds up great and Industry Baby is an all-timer guest verse. At his best, Jack Harlow is an incredibly charming presence with a great flow and a real ear for creative rhymes, but First Class proved to be to Jack what Home Alone 2 was to Macaulay Culkin, an overexposed kid buying his own hype and going into pop sellout mode as he claims the number one spot by birthright. Girl, I like you. Now, this has been a pretty good year for Doja Cat's boobs, all things considered, but watching her run topless through a field of posies while cooing about how badly she wants to have sex with the guy who made White Iverson is just the death of pleasure. You made Doja Cat's boobs sad. How did you do that? The song was one unfortunate choice away from being a breezy, delightful summer jam. A lot of people seem to get the idea that when I made fun of Luke Combs singing a sex jam like this, the reason I thought it didn't work was because of what a big guy he is. And I'd just like to clarify that that is not the case at all. Meatloaf has made some of the most romantic songs of all time, Jack Black is a bona fide sex god, and Lizzo can pull as many birds as she wants to. My issue with this song isn't that it's being sung by a big guy. The issue is that Luke Combs is singing this sweet, lights down low bedroom ballad in a tone that makes it seem like his idea of sex is tackling the girl like a line backer. Let's get some might be a surprising pick for a dishonorable mention since I've repeatedly been an apologist for this song and that hasn't really changed, but I think that this being the number one song of 2022 makes sense in the worst possible way. Heat Waves was already one of the 20 biggest hits of 2021, and yet 2022 was so devoid of big name releases that nothing was able to dethrone it as the number one song of the year. Do you realize just how insane that is? This song hit number one on its 59th week on the Hot 100, and it stayed on the charts until this past Christmas. It first charted on the first week of January 2021. Do you have any idea how long ago that was? Do you realize just how much the world has changed in the time that Heat Waves has been charting? I know you think you do, but... Do you really? When heat waves first started charting, the average price of a dozen eggs in the US was a buck fifty. Back when heat waves first started charting, up and coming superstar Morgan Wallen was everyone's favorite little unproblematic country boy from Sneedville. Back when heat waves started charting, Steve Lacey hadn't even been born yet. Before heat waves, Rascal Flats. Right now, no Rascal Flats. Back when Heat Waves first charted, AJR was in the top 10, and considering the way the world is going, I expect them to return to it any day now. Back when Heat Waves first started charting, no one knew or cared what an NFT was. Among Us was the biggest game around. Making a Winnie the Pooh horror movie was illegal. There was good faith surrounding the idea of Harry Styles' acting career. Adele, Beyonce, Kendrick Lamar, Lord, and Rihanna had all not released any albums in years. Back when Heat Waves first started charting, Joe Biden was still the vice president of the United States. Wait. Back when Heat Waves first started charting, DaBaby was a really cool guy that everyone liked having around. Back when Heat Waves first started charting, the V30 was only just an idea. Back when Heat Waves first charted, Frank Ocean hadn't dropped an album in five years. And now he hasn't dropped one in six. Back when Heat Waves first started charting, the most recent Marvel movie was Spider-Man Far From Home. Lil Nas X's future career still looked uncertain. Concerts, such as this one, still weren't happening. Back when Heat Waves first started charting, Olivia Rodrigo was just some Disney kid no one over the age of 13 had ever heard of. Back when Heat Waves first started charting, you would never expect Drake to beef with a YouTuber 10 times less famous than him. Back when Heat Waves first charted, there might have been a few people who still liked James Corden. Breaking Bad was just a show everyone loved and not a massive meme. I didn't have this water bottle. Nobody had heard the name Mysterious Mr. Enter in years. Back when Heat Waves first started charting, Britney Spears' conservatorship was finally coming to an end. Back when Heat Waves first started charting, Spotify hadn't chosen this guy over this guy. Back when Heat Waves first charted, people were still caring about GameStop for the first time in years. 
B- before we went right back to not caring about it again. Back when heat waves first charted, we could be reasonably sure that any art we saw online was made by a human. And last but not least, back when heat waves first started charting, Kanye West. The video is over now. See you in part two. How can I be homophobic? My bitch is gay. Please do me a favor and write a comment or two below discussing what you thought about this video, the music I talked about in it, or literally anything else. Interaction is hugely important to YouTube's algorithm, so along with liking, subscribing, and joining my Patreon, comments are some of the best appreciation you can show if you enjoy what I do. While you write your comments, let's take a moment to sit back, relax, and listen to what some of my patrons had to say about the hit songs of 2022. From Amelia Wenzel regarding Enemy by Imagine Dragons and J.I.D., I would complain about how this song sounds overly melodramatic, brash, and dumb even for the band that made it, but nope. I'm just gonna say that it copied Genius from CL, Labyrinth, and Diplo, just louder and even more repetitive. From Sweet Bees regarding Victoria's Secret by Jax, the worst thing about this song is not that it's a sophomoric and frankly not even accurate take on the Victoria's Secret brand, the worst thing is that it's sung like Jax's gargling toothpaste the whole time. From Siska Sinatria regarding Shut Down by Blackpink, this is the most tired Blackpink song I've ever heard. The production is lumpy, all of the members phone in their performance, and the content has been done to death before, just a very uninspired song. From Lydia Void Valentino regarding Antihero by Taylor Swift, this is the kind of song that usually wins me over, but between the washed out production and how awkward and unflinchingly self-flagellating the lyrics are, this song feels like it actively dampens my mood whenever I listen to it. From Jen from Starter Quest regarding I'm Good by Baby Rexa and David Guetta, rewording a dumb song about a depressed blue alien to make Baby Rexa sound like a depressed blue alien was hands down the worst experience in music for me. I'm Blue is high grade catchy Euro cheese with a lot of charm. I'm Good is like you turned its strong parmesan into craft singles. Do your cover of the original you cowards, TikTok didn't make this big for its lyrics. From That Guy Harvey regarding I Ain't Worried by One Republic, you want to use this song for the new Toyota commercial? Also, way to rip the whistle right out of young folks, you shameless fuck. From Toriana Frazier regarding A B C D E F U by Gale, you know, I was just gonna let this one go, and then I remembered this song was nominated for the Song of the Year Grammy, and I lost it. This song is not pleasant to listen to, it's juvenile in all the wrong ways, the only good thing about this song is that she specifically spares the dog from being told off. From Memorian Sunrise regarding Anti-Fragile by La Seraph, from that squeaking noise that sounds like a Will I Am reject from 2013 to the annoying vocal performances that bring absolutely no attitude or firepower that you need for this sorry excuse of an empowerment anthem, and we cap it off with just about the worst rap verse of the whole year. You're not anti fragile, you're anti listenable. From Caitlin Sheffel Zhao regarding Broadway Girls by Lil Durk and Morgan Wallen, this song is the worst example of manufactured consent in the music industry since Dr. Luke started producing again under Tyson tracks. Just the industry putting out a product specifically to redirect the conversation around Morgan Wallen and giving Amy to defenders of him when people want to bring up his past behavior. On top of that, Wallen sounds like absolute shit. Disgusting. And from Christopher Carasa regarding Pushin' P by Gunna and Future featuring Young Thug, the only people looking pathetic here are the folks over at YSL who aren't in on the joke and lack the self-awareness of how the public made this song big because it was a laughing stock. For Gunna to have a more prominent solo hit in the future, he'll have to make music worse and stupider than this intentionally. Don't expect him to make his first day out track after his Rocky 2022. That would require effort. Join my Patreon for just one one dollar per video to submit your own patron rankings for the music you want to talk about. See you next time, and until then, take care of yourselves.